What's up, YouTube? This is Too Raw for TV. All right, so in this particular video, I want to go ahead and continue with this uh, best three players of each NBA franchise's history. Uh, I've gone through quite a few teams now, and now I want to go ahead and do the Phoenix Suns. And before I, well, you already see the three guys I picked. So before I uh, go into talking about why I picked these guys, um, I want to do an honorable mention. Uh, so I want to salute to players such as Devin Booker. Uh, I'll go ahead and mention Chris Paul, though I think that by the time Chris Paul appeared with the Phoenix Suns, he was in the downside of his career. Kevin Durant has not played it long enough to be really mentioned with these guys. Uh, Alvin Adams, Connie Hawkins, Tom and Dick Van Arsdale, uh, Paul Westfall, uh, Paul Silas, Gar Hurd. Want to give a shout out to Dennis Johnson, of course, who played with the Phoenix Suns, Eddie Johnson, uh, Tom Chambers, Walter Davis who I considered putting third on this list uh, ahead of Kevin Johnson. I strongly considered it. I also want to give a shout-out to Jeff Hornacek, if I haven't mentioned him yet, Dan Marley. Um, a lot of different guys, man. Um, Rex Chapman, Jason Kidd, Stephon Marbury. Um, Joe Johnson, um, Jason Richardson. Sh have I said Sean Marion yet? If I haven't, Sean Marion. And a few more. Probably some guys I've missed. But number three, I have KJ, man. KJ, I think from the time of Magic Johnson's retirement to the rise of Jason Kidd and Gary Payton, so late 91 into around 95, I think that KJ was the best point guard in the NBA. Yes, he had some some opposition for that one. I mean, he had some opposition to that title, uh, chiefly maybe uh, Tim Hardaway. But I will give it, give it to KJ, man. He he was um, a, a really good offensive player, uh, despite the fact that he was playing on teams with different guys that could score. Um, Marley earlier on, Havacek earlier on, Tom Chambers earlier on, Eddie Johnson later on, Barkley, um, you know, Danny Manning briefly, um, Richard Dumas, um, Cedric Sabalos, who I forgot to mention, by the way, uh, an honorable mention. Despite playing with these guys, he was still able to average 20 points per game. And he was one of the best playmakers in the NBA. There was a stretch where for four consecutive years he averaged at least 10 assists per contest. Um, played in the NBA Finals, though he didn't play particularly well in that Finals. Um, he played 12 years for the Phoenix Suns, appeared in 683 games, and in those 683 games averaged 18.7 points, 9.5 assists, 1.5 steals, on 49.4% shooting from the floor and 84.1% from the free throw line. And that's another thing. In those series, I mean, excuse me, in those games, he shot, uh, he, he went to the line 6.7 times per contest, which is a lot for a point guard. That was one thing that KG did when he was younger. Young KG was pretty explosive, man. Had hops. Um, we all know if you go on highlights, if you look up KJ, uh, KJ highlights on YouTube, there's two notable dunks that he had. Um, awesome dunks. And the 94 playoffs, I think it was 94 playoffs. Was it 94 or 95? I think it was the 94 playoffs. But someone can correct me if it was 95. But I think in 94 playoffs, KJ has this awesome dunk on Elijah Wong. I mean, just sick, man. Sick. The angle he did it on. And remember, KJ was only six feet, what, six foot one? How tall was KJ? Six two? Six one? Yeah, so for him to be that little man, but to have those hops, man, especially for the injuries, 
Then there was another dunk that was crazy, maybe even more crazy, from the angle of the explosiveness when he dunked on um, Hot Rod uh, Williams. And I think that was in a game back in like 90 or something, maybe 91. But yeah, KJ was explosive, man. He would take it to the trees. But in an era where there was these big guys down low, you know, Young Matumbo, Manute Bo, George Mirasan, Ewing, Robinson, Young Shaq, uh, Lajuan, like I said, uh, Mark Eaton, Moses Malone. I'm just naming the shot blockers, Tree Rollins. You know, when you had to play a league against these guys, so just big dudes in general that could put you on your ass. Or just physical players, Bill Ambeer, Charles Oakley, um, J- Jason Williams, the, the power forward, um, Barkley when he was the opposition before he got there, Carl Malone, Dennis Robin, if I haven't mentioned him yet, uh, Rick Mahorn. The list goes on and on and on. So, you know, KJ had a decent mid range game, wasn't much of an outside shooter for most of his career. But athletic, uh, very good playmaker, gifted playmaker, um, a great clutch performer. Could be a little inconsistent at times. Um, and was a bit turnover prone. Um, you know, I remember that about him. But uh, and it wasn't a great defender, obviously. But... You know, I I look at his all-star years. His best years were, to me, 1988 to 94. During that stretch, 20.4 points, 3.4 rebounds, 10.5 assists, 1.7 steals, 49.8% shooting from the floor, and 83.7% from the charity stripe. In the playoffs for his career, KJ, um... In 11 years, he played in 105 playoff games, 19.3 points, 8.9 assists, 1.3 steals, 46.9% shooting from the floor, and 83.3% from the charity stripe. And uh, his best playoff years, 88 to 95, 21.6 points, 3.5 3.5 rebounds, 9.9 assists, 1.3 steals, 48.2% shooting from the floor, uh, 29.8% from three-point range. Like I said, he's never a great three-point shooter, but for that era, 29.8% was like maybe shooting 33% today and 83.4% from the charity strike. Um... Kevin Johnson, as far as his accolades are concerned, three-time NBA All-Star, four-time All-NBA second-teamer, All-NBA third-team one year, most improved player in 1989, number seven is retired by the Phoenix Suns, and um, also won gold in the FIBA World Championship in 1994. By the way, I think I've mentioned this before. That 94 team, I think, could have contended with the 92 Dream Team for talent, uh, player for player. Let's see if I can look at the roster. They were called Dream Team 2, and they beat Russia 137-91 in the final, final and they were, they were 8-0 in that tourney. And that team, Dream Team 2, let me see, I'm trying to see how much they won each game by. Let's see. Hmm. 
can't see it right now. Um, Have to do a little bit more research later on, man. But yeah, Dream Team Two consisted of. Sorry for taking so long. Dream T Two had players at Derek Coleman, Joe Dumars, KJ, Larry Johnson, Sean Kemp, Dan Marley, Reggie Miller, Alonzo Warren, Shaq, Mark Price, Steve Smith, and Dominique Wilkins. Yeah, um, they were a really good fucking team. So that's my third guy, Kevin Johnson. Number two, I have Charles Barkley. Now, you can make a case that Charles Barkley should be number one. Because to me, yeah, he is a more dominant player than Steve Nash overall, right? He's just a more dominant player. But the reason why I chose Steve Nash is his longevity with the Phoenix Suns. Um, he was just there a lot longer. Um, he was there a lot longer, so there were, therefore, you know, he put in more work as a Phoenix Suns, as a Sun player. And while he didn't appear in the NBA Finals, he won two league MVPs. I can't ignore that. No matter how much I don't think he should have won those two, the fact of the matter is he did. He did. And when I coupled that with the fact that he played with the Phoenix Suns that long, I got to put him number one over Charles Barkley as a Phoenix Suns. Not as a player. Not as a player all time. But let's get that distinction clear. Not as an all-time player. But as a Phoenix Sun, I got to I gotta put him a little bit over Charles Barkley. Some people not agree with that. It is what it is. Number two, I have Charles Barkley. Okay? Um... Charles Barkley, let's see his accolades as a Phoenix Sun. He won league MVP in 92-93, his first year with the team, because he always said the problem with Philly wasn't that he did he wasn't great. He felt he was the best player in the NBA. He just said, I don't have any damn help. Now he had help. Uh, he was an all-star in 93, 94, 95, and 96, so all four years. He was a um, all-NBA first-team player in 93, all-NBA second-teamer in 94 and 95, and all-NBA third-team in 96, which I never understood why his 96 season is so unappreciated. I, I think it had to do with the fact that the Phoenix Suns only won 41 games. And we're in rebuilding mode. Because if you think about it, Charles Barkley kind of was under the radar in 96. And it wasn't because he his play was bad. I think he averaged like 23 points and 11 and a half rebounds that year. But the Phoenix Suns just were sort of under the radar that year. Dan Marley had gone. KJ was hurt a lot of the year. Um, anyway. Hmm. <sighs> Excuse me, KJ. Uh, excuse me, Charles Barkley is on the 50th and 75th anniversary teams. He's in the Phoenix Suns Ring of Honor, though his number should be retired. Um, and as a Phoenix Sun, like I said, he played four seasons for the Phoenix Suns, and in those years, he averaged 23.2 points. 11.4 rebounds, 4.3 assists, 1.6 steals, nearly one block a game with .8 per game, 50.1% shooting from the floor, 30.1% from deep three-point range, and 75.1% from the charity stripe. And he got to the line 7.5 times per game. Uh, so Charles Barkley, 280 games. Uh, he really did the job. In the playoffs for the Phoenix Suns, in those four years, he appeared in 48 playoff games. 22.9 points, 11.6 rebounds, 3.5 assists, 1.5 steals, 
48.6% shooting from the floor in the postseason, 27.3% from three-point range, and 76.3% from the charity stripe. And I'm just looking... Um, you can make an argument that his strongest playoff run might have been Statistically, maybe 95. But, you know, he always played. I mean, he didn't always play well. But uh, for the most part, Charles Barkley had great games. He had some bad games, too, obviously. He did. He had some bad games. He had some really, really bad playoff games, um, like everybody. But for the most part, uh, he was known for being a guy that brought his best game when it mattered the most, usually. For his team, but there were some games when he didn't play particularly well. Um, Charles Barkley uh, brought the Phoenix Suns from being a good team that was good enough to get to the postseason but would flame out. He helped to catapult them to a championship level team. Many people feel like if it wasn't for Michael Jordan's superhuman performance, in that finals. By the way, Charles Barkley had a great 1993 finals. Um, 27 points, 13 rebounds, like 6 assists. I mean, any other player would have been in consideration for MVP. But when Michael Jordan did what he did, 41 points, 8 rebounds, 4 assists, or something like that. I mean, a 55-point game. Uh, I mean, it's just... He was just on another level, and I, th- and I really feel sorry for the Dick Licks because they don't really, they didn't really get to see that man do what he does. You know, they don't get it, and they never will. But anyway, number two, I have Charles Barkley, and number one, I got Steve Nash, man. Um, as a Phoenix Sun, two league MVPs. Um, he was, as a Phoenix Sun, ooh, I got to look at this. Altogether, he played 10 seasons as a Phoenix Suns. He was drafted by the Suns in 96. He left, I think he was traded to the Dallas Mavericks in 98. And I, th- th- I think he left as a free agent in 2004 and came back to Phoenix where he played his best years, eight years altogether. So, um, two-time league MVP as a Phoenix Sun. Um, He was a five-time All-Star as a Phoenix Sun. Uh, Three times All-NBA first team as a Phoenix Sun. Two times All-NBA second team as a Phoenix Sun. Five times led the NBA in assists as a Phoenix Sun. A member of the 50-40-90 club four times. Four times, including three consecutive seasons as a Phoenix Sun. Phoenix Sun's ring of honor, though his number should be retired. He's on the 75th anniversary team. And... um, Let's look at this. Look at something right quick. Uh, let's see. That's twelve years. That's twelve seasons all together. No, ten seasons. I take that back. It's ten seasons as a Phoenix Sun, and uh, he appeared in seven hundred forty-four contests. During those years, he averaged 14.4 points, 3.1 rebounds, 9.4 assists, 50.4% shooting from the floor, 43.5% from three-point range. Well, he didn't take a lot of threes, but he was very, very accurate. He took very smart shots, and he was a 90.7% free throw shooter during that stretch with the Phoenix Suns. Um, So... For his career, 
altogether 49, 43, and 90. But as a son, he was 50, 43, 91. Let, let's let it get. This is a jump shooter. A jump shooter who was six foot three and 195 pounds and not athletic. 50, 43, 91. Imagine what Steve Kerr would, uh, excuse me, Steve Nash would do today. Imagine what he would do today with all the spacing that would be available today. Um, awesome shooter. Awesome shooter. Um, second to Steph Curry in free throw shooting in history. Just behind him at 90.4%. And I think Curry's now uh, uh, somewhere around 90 point, uh, 90.7% or something like that. But anyway, um, his best years, Steve Nash, as a son, 2005, shit, really, I'd say to 2011. So during that seven-year window, 16.7 points. Now, don't get me wrong, he could score, but... Um, he was not a guy who was going to put up 30, 40 points per game. I think his career high was 42. But he was not a guy whose game was predicated on scoring the basketball, though he could shoot. Um, but he wasn't a premise scorer, per se. But um, his strengths were instinctively passing the basketball, leading the fast break, but being a threat to score the basketball off of the strength of others who were better natural scorers. Um, with his shooting ability, um, he was deadlier being the beneficiary of others who could score. Uh, that's what Steve Nash's strengths, you know. When the Phoenix Suns struggled to me was when Steve Nash was being a little bit more aggressive scoring the basketball, and defenses were keen in on him, and other guys were struggling, not getting into rhythm. That's when the Phoenix Suns, I think, struggled. And also, of course, the, the knock on Steve Nash and the Phoenix Suns to an extent, but especially Steve Nash, he was an atrocious defender. Um, I mean, just awful. Okay, I, I don't mean bad or just below average. He was fucking atrocious. He was as bad defensively as Draymond Green is sometimes offensively, or Dennis Robin, you know what I mean? But anyway, this stretch, 16.7 points, 3.5 rebounds, 11 assists per contest. Um, didn't average many steals, because defensively he just, 50.8% shooting from the floor, 44% from three, and 91.3% from the charity strike. Um, Steve Nash never appeared in the NBA Finals, as I've said before, but in the playoffs as a Phoenix Sun <coughs> in seven seasons, 75 appearances in the postseason, 18.2 points, 9.7 assists, 49.7% shooting from the floor, 38.2% from three-point range, and 89.8% from the charity strike. And as you can see in the postseason, he led the postseason in assists average for four consecutive years. 2004, but that was with the Dallas Mavericks. With the Phoenix Suns, he led three straight years. 05, 06, and 07. Matter of fact, in 07, he averaged 18.9 points and 13.3 assists per contest. And he shot 48.7% from three-point range in 2007. Um, Steve Nash was just unbelievable, man. Um, trying to see something here. His first three playoff runs as a Phoenix Sun... 21.2 points, 11.3 assists, almost four rebounds, 50% shooting from the floor, 40% from three-point range, and 91% from the charity strike. And, you know, they were 
seven seconds or less offense. An amazing team to watch in the uh, mid 2000s and a precursor to the NBA of today. So, Steve Nash, number one. Tell me what you guys think. 